Okay, well, welcome everybody to Solar Noon Tuesday. I'm Jay Warmke with uh, solarpvtraining.com. And what we do here typically is we're going to um, go through in three steps in this session. The first portion of this, I go ahead and recap what's happening in the world of solar, the news for the, the most current week. Then we'll look at what's happening as far as um, upcoming webinars, upcoming conferences, things of that. And then we go into a deep dive, um, deep, deep, whatever we can do in 20 minutes uh, on um, a, a topic of interest within the solar industry. Usually something that's interesting to me that's crossed my desk this week. And this week, what we're going to do is we're going to look at how data centers and actually in cryptocurrency are really looking to make some major impact transforming the grid, some of the issues, some of the warning signs that are coming on the horizon, because I, I once again, don't feel like we're ready for what's coming. So uh, that said, let's jump into the wonderful world of solar here. This is what's happening in the week of September 22nd. And uh, a number, uh, there was a recent survey done by the Solar and Storage Industries Institute, and they surveyed farmers to see what their opinion was of utility scale um, solar. And, and what these farmers said, uh, uh, that basically 70% of them are open to installing large solar arrays on their farm, as long as they incorporate some sort of dual use or some sort of agrivoltaics aspect to it, where farming activities can continue uh, in tandem with these um, utility scale projects. Now, this report was done as part of a larger project that was being funded by the US Department of Energy that was looking at what are some of the barriers of farmers to solar to utility scale and how these can be overcome. Um, according to NREL, currently, only about 10% of these large scale systems do incorporate some form of agrivoltaics in their design. Now, there still is a lot of opposition by the agricultural community to solar, and that seems to only be increasing as this becomes a political thing. Um, as many as 78% of the respondents said that they had some concern, either somewhat or very concerned, about the impact of um, solar on farm prices, as well as on access to farmland. 77% were concerned that large-scale solar was going to impact the availability of farmland into future, into the future generations. 42% said they were concerned about how solar was going to impact uh, farm productivity. They didn't really go into um, much detail about what that meant. Uh, I'm not quite sure. And then 40% were concerned about uh, the impact of solar on soil quality. There's been a lot of misinformation out there in this community about how solar can, in theory, leach uh, arsenic specifically, and I think uh, selenium into the soil. Uh, that kind of been debunked. Um, and if the farmers looked at what was contained in the pesticides and the fertilizers that they use, they'd have zero concern about um, uh, solar for that aspect, because they do concern uh, con contain large quantities of selenium, as well as um, as arsenic. And um, Oops, there we go. And then a report also found that the uh, farmers would be much more likely to support solar, uh, specifically for smaller systems that are there to uh, handle the electrical generation for the farm operation itself. So it's not so much an opposition against solar. It's more an opposition about what is the impact of these very large systems going to have on farmland and the farm way of life, which is a legitimate concern for sure. Okay, uh, Oxford PV uh, recently announced last week, uh, or that this week, that they're going to begin shipping um, solar panels that incorporate perovskite uh, to customers within the United States. Now, perovskite is a family of materials that have shown a very high potential for um, high efficiency as well as low cost of production for solar cells. 
Um, but when they've been deployed out there in the real world, they've shown that they tend to have stability issues. Now, there have been a lot of recent reports that these stability issues have been overcome. And this is really the very first um, commercially available product that does incorporate uh, perovskite. Now, these perovskite Ox Oxford Solar's PV cells are a tandem panel that has a layer of perovskite and a layer of silicon. Um, they have been shown to be about 20% more efficient than traditional silicon uh, panels that only have silicon alone. In fact, these, these panels have set an efficiency record of just under 27%. Uh, and they are looking towards the ability of not only uh, lowering the cost of utility scale um, with this perovskite uh, tandem cell, because of the increased productivity, you can get more production out of the same land footprint. And of course, land being a significant cost in utility scale production. AEP Ohio just made a request to uh, the uh, PUC, oh, the Public Utility Commission of Ohio, uh, requesting a new rate structure for the new data centers um, with loads greater than 25 megawatts and cryptocurrency or uh, mobile data centers with load uh, capacity greater than one megawatt. Now, what they're doing is under this proposal, they're basically saying, okay, before we install the infrastructure that is going to be demanded for these data centers, we want you, the customer, to guarantee AEP for 10 years, for a period of 10 years that you're going to use at minimum 90% of all of the power that you're projecting that you're going to be using. Now that of course locks in these data centers to the to AEP as, as a provider of power for the next 10 years. Um, big companies like Google, Amazon, Microsoft, and Meta have testified against this new rate structure saying that it is in fact um, discriminatory and unreasonable and that the 90% that they're putting out there is just arbitrary. They haven't really shown any reason to show that this is going to be a true cost recovery for AEP. Now, AEP, on the other hand, is arguing that they have already seen a, a 15 gigawatt um, ramp up in projected load growth due to these data centers and that they have to make a seven to 10 year investment in this infrastructure and that this new data structure will, and, and I found this quote kind of interesting, um, will provide these data center and crypto customers with quote, a clear understanding of their obligations as customers. So that's interesting, interesting um, frame of reference there. Uh, the Biden administration uh, has the dramatic hikes that they've put in place in tariffs on certain products coming from China are going into effect this week. In fact, um, the 27th of September, the first tariff hikes, um, the rest of them are actually going to take place next year, 2025. The final tariff structure includes 14 different categories of products that cover thousands of different products specifically. But this week, what's going into effect is a 100% tariff on electric vehicles imported from China, a 25% tariff on lithium ion batteries that are coming in for EVs uh, from China, and a 50% tariff on solar panels and solar cells that are being imported from China. A 50% tariff on semiconductors, from China will go into effect in 2025. Now, the Biden administration has argued that taking this action is necessary in order to protect American workers and American businesses. And their hope is that by implementing these very steep tariffs, that China will begin to change its, what they're calling an unfair trade practices, uh, specifically in the areas of technology transfer, uh, intellectual property rights, as well as innovation of product. And during the last presidential debate between Vice President Kamala Harris and former President Donald Trump, Trump argued uh, that the against the transition away from fossil fuels towards renewables. And elegant as ever, he did say, and this is a quote, you believe in things that were not going to frack, we're not going to take fossil fuel, 
We're not going to do things that are going to make this country strong, whether you like it or not. Germany tried that, and within one year, they were back to building normal energy plants. Now, that's the quote. Now, he was apparently referencing Germany's climate law that sets out a framework for reaching net zero uh, carbon emissions by the year 2045. Uh, in response to this assertion, the Germany uh, that that Germany's given up plans for this renewable energy transition. Germany's federal foreign office issued a statement on September 11th, and the statement said in part, "Quote: Like it or not, Germany's energy system is fully operational, with more than 50% renewables, and we're shutting down, not building coal and nuclear plants." Coal will be fully off the grid by 2038 at the latest. P.S. We also don't eat cats and dogs. And that is the news from the solar industry for this week. So uh, anybody have any comments on um, what's happening in the week of solar? Uh, anything on that as well as uh, anything that might have crossed your desk? Uh, just wanted to throw in there, uh, Jay. Yeah that the uh, foreign office there in Germany had been pretty much widely criticized to be partisan in their response uh, by the media in Germany. So um, there have been a, a lot of critiques of, of that uh, <laughs> response to, to that statement. Uh -huh. I thought it was pretty funny when I actually, when I read it to my wife, she said, I thought the Germans didn't have a sense of humor. So that was her. That was her response. Well, I so. guess the non-humor side is on the media. <laughs> I guess so. I, apparently, you must be um, must be proper. So, uh, that, uh, yeah, Eric, you had a you had a comment. Oh, Eric, you're muted there. Okay, I went to Germany this summer, and I was just really amazed how forward they are in renewables. Uh, Everywhere you go, you'll see solar, you know, farms and gardens, uh, trains. They have, you know, the, you know, the uh, green, like, you know, materials on roofs. They have, you know, beehives at hotels. I mean, yeah. they are really ahead of everything. Yeah, I think uh, traditionally uh, Germany was one of the very early adopters. And, and from a renewable energy standpoint, they have definitely been uh, a leader. Uh, Japan was also very much a leader in this, uh, and and U.S. has been a bit of a follower in the transition in the energy transition. I think the fair to say, even though um, Siggy pointed out that uh, Germany is getting a, that the Foreign Office, because obviously they were making fun of Donald Trump, um, that they were pointing out that what he said was factually just not true, and um, and surprise surprise, it was just factually not true. So there are there are company or countries, including the United States, that certainly continue to build fossil fuel plants. And that's gonna that's gonna continue. But the energy transition is well underway and, and we talk about that every week. Yeah, Bill, you've got a comment? Yeah. I was quite, I was wondering in that in the tariffs on, on imported Chinese panels, does that also include silicon wafers? I mean, we don't produce a very high percentage, in fact, almost zero silicon in terms of wafers. And yet our factories in, you know, Longy in there in Ohio and, uh, and Jinko down in Florida, they mostly just assemble. And I think that's the case for most of what are called American manufacturers at this point. They assemble, they don't really produce the raw material. Right. I think that it does. I think it does include that. Um, and, and as you're right, as you point out, we really don't have a silicon industry. In fact, China, I think, if I recall, is like 90 percent of the world's silicon and silicon wafers. Um, it, it's one reason why um, solar panels are costing almost double here in the United States as in other countries is because of the implementation of these tariffs. We will be paying higher prices for for solar panels um, than the rest of the world, for sure. So, Al, you had a comment? Yeah, that leads right into my question. Where is Germany sourcing all their materials and panels? <laughs> 
Well, Germany, of course, has a has a um, a production capacity, but I'm I I would imagine they get the vast majority from China. Um, I know one of the reasons Australia has so low a uh, installation cost. In fact, typical residential solar installation in Australia is a dollar a watt or less, uh, as opposed to three dollars a watt here in the U.S. And much of that has to do with the streamlined permitting process. You get rid of a bunch of those um, sort of intangible costs, those uh, costs that aren't really part of the, the soft costs that aren't of value, but they do get their panels directly from China. So I think there are a lot of countries that are taking advantage of the fact that China is subsidizing their solar industry. And they're sort of taking the attitude of, hey, if you want to pay for part of the cost of our solar installation, great, we'll let you, you know, and, and I, I don't necessarily disagree with that. Obviously, tariffs are in place to try and protect a domestic industry. And, and the powers that be are saying, okay, during COVID, we saw what happens when we have severe supply chain interruptions. And it certainly gives China a, a significant powerful position when it comes to manipulating the supply of solar panels. Um, I don't know that solar panels are as a strategic um, supply as, for instance, microchips, that, that I could see that being a defense and, and it gets into a whole bunch of different areas. Um, if if I controlled the world, I think I would say, okay, China, you want to pay for us to install silicon? Great. We're going to now focus on perovskite, and we're going to be the next. We're going to own the next generation of solar manufacturing, rather than try and fight them for the rotary telephone market, because that's kind of what silicon will be in ten years. We'll look back and say, okay, we're fighting over this old technology. Why didn't we just leapfrog ahead and dominate? the newer technologies. Al, did you have another question there? No, that's good, thanks. Okay. All right, any other questions from anybody before we jump into what's happening this week? Um, okay, let me just hit some of the announcements here. Uh, there is a webinar coming up on the 25th, the digital tools for the energy transition. All of these are Eastern uh, time, and uh, I'm I'm going to let you look up how to find the links for these now that you're aware of them. Uh, September 25th at 2 p.m. Unlocking the future. Uh, this is about uh, energy storage solutions uh, for commercial, uh, community, and industrial solar storage. So for large storage systems. The 26th at 2 p.m. Uh, grid interconnection tools, that's coming up there. And um, then renewables, October 1st, 1 p.m., renewables for heavy industry. Uh, this is something I haven't seen cross my desk before about uh, heavy industry. You know, I assume they're talking about things like, uh, I don't know, steel mills, uh, dye, um, aluminum factories, things of that nature. October 3rd at 2 p.m., carbon capture. Uh, that's something that the government loves to talk about. October 15th at noon, UL 3741. This has to do with uh, fire res first responder fire um, dealing with, uh, it's in the realm of rapid shutdown issues, uh, what they should be aware of. Then October 17th at 2 p.m., we have uh, scaling your business basically for um, commercial and industrial solar. So if you're in the um, residential market and, and you're wanting to expand into larger systems, webinar for you. The DC Clean Energy Summit coming up here uh, October 30th. Now this one's, uh, you can be there face-to-face -face or it's also being live streamed on the web if you wanna participate there. And always, as per always on solarpvtraining.com, we have our in-person and online training and we are still, I'm still plugging this book, not a New York Times bestseller just yet, but who knows, we can always keep our fingers crossed. Um, understanding photovoltaics, uh, number nine. Okay, I see, um, let's see, two hands raised. Uh, why don't you guys jump in? Let me know what you need that maybe they're old hands. All right, and um, and before I jump into the topic of the day, I think Eric, uh, I see you're on the call and uh, you were wanting to bring up an item 
Uh, for yeah, this that's, that's really what I raised my hand about. I just wanted, if you want me to talk about that today or- Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, why don't oh. you, can you turn throw on your video? Sure. Uh, I made myself pretty for you guys today, you know? Oh, yeah. All right. There All you right. Go. I, I don't see any eyeliner, so. <laughs> Um, so, um, uh, it's funny. I, I'm, um, uh, I'm I like, I got like the power company here right now trying to make adjustments, uh, with one of my problems. So I recently have gotten a, um, PV system and it's, it's made with the whole suite of end phase products. So IQ gateway and combiner, uh, is a. Oh, okay. Um, let's see. Eric, you just froze on me. <laughs> the The power company must have uh, just uh, shut you down. 5P battery. Oh, there you go. You still can't hear me? Oh, there you go. I see you now. Okay. All righty. Okay, he froze again. Is somebody, could somebody comment? Let me know if it's mine, my system or his. Uh, you guys hearing me just fine? His system. His system. Okay, Eric, we're going to have to try it again when the power company's not there. So uh, uh, we'll we'll jump on that later. All right, thanks. Um, okay, so let me get into the topic that we're going to discuss this week. Um, and and I wanted to. I found it interesting when I was looking at that AEP article about how crypto um, is going to be charged a different rate, and they're wanting a certain amount of uh, security before they build the infrastructure for those and how the crypto bros are, are in, a, in a tizzy over that. And I was just curious to do a little bit more um, research to see just what is the impact, what's going on here in that industry. And, and like so many of these things in our society, the more you know about something, the less sleep you're gonna get at night, you know? So that's never, never helpful. But I, I just thought we would we would talk a little bit about the data centers, um, what what's involved. Um, in case you're wondering why this is such a big deal, um, we we talk about these terms, data centers. But if you see any of the advertisements out there that are saying put this on the cloud, um, all of the different storage that is used by. Amazon or Netflix, um, all of that's going to be in data centers. Um, all of your storage and pictures of your, you know, your daughter's wedding, uh, all that stuff that's pushed out there onto the cloud. These things are all contained in the data centers. And of course, there's a lot of data crunching for industry and for businesses that's taking place. So um, all of these things, just the more we rely on this technology, the more uh, we're we're finding that uh, these data center usage expands. So what does what do they use this? Um, uh, what who is using the power? And I guess within the solar industry, we tend to think about residential customers. You know, if you're get, getting started, but we can see here residential buildings are only going to use about twenty five percent, twenty six percent of the power that's used with the, on the grid. Then you get into commercial systems, that's another 20%. But industrial systems, according to these numbers here, is, is, is the lion's share, really, these large industrial systems. And what we're going to find is that data centers um, and, and even cryptocurrency and mobile data centers, when you talk about those 5G networks that are out there, they're using power. And, and that's increasingly a big part of the industrial usage uh, that's out there of of electricity. So when we look at the um, this particular from World Energy Statistics is pushing out that really by 2030 that this um, communication systems are going to be using close to 21 percent of all of the electricity that's used in the world. So it becomes a, an increasingly large slice of, of the pie. You know, if you just sort of follow down on that, it looks like that's about double of what communication does this year. So we're going to be seeing a doubling of the percentage, um, may not be a doubling of the amount of electricity, but of, of the electricity that's being used, it becomes more and more of a critical share. Um, data centers being that green portion, 
than consumer devices. They certainly use it um, and networks and the like. Um, so what does a data center, how much does it consume? Well, a large data center is essentially going to consume about the same as 37,000 homes. So that each data center that's out there is, is the equivalent of a fairly large little town. Um, you know, so, so this becomes a big infrastructure concern. I mean, I live near Zanesville, Ohio. It has a population around 50,000. So if one data center comes in, it's essentially doubling the capacity of that, of that community. And accordingly, the infrastructure has to be in place. Now, uh, all of the estimates that are out there, I saw this number come up in a lot of different locations. About 4% of the global energy consumption today is for data centers set to double or more than double in the next six years. We keep using these um, numbers of 2030. Um, that feels like it's a long way off, but really only five and a half years off in the future. Um, probably about the next time I have to buy a new pair of shoes. So, um, you know, that's, that's not that far away. Uh, so it's going to be about 9%, 9% of, of the um, U.S. or the world's energy use. And I found it interesting that about 45% of all of the data centers in the country are um, here in the USA, or not in the country, in the world. So, so the U.S. is very much the data center capital. Uh, Eric, I see you. Your hand is up there. Are, uh, <laughs> is your power back? Is that the the plan? Let's. Yep, you got a question. You're still muted. I'm back. Yep. Okay. So for your for your particular thing, since I'm on a roll, why don't we hold that till sure. the end? And uh, okay, doke. Sure. All right. So so this is what the data centers are looking at. Um, so then we uh, say, well, how much how much power, how much growth are we are we looking at? So I found a couple of um, uh, graphs here. So fixed ask, ask, asset wired networks. Um, these were looking at a a fairly dramatic growth rate, and um, and then what what gets me a little more troubled when looking at some of these projections. And you'll see this as I as I scan through some of these graphs, is there's sort of the what is the best case scenario, what's the expected scenario, and what's the worst case scenario from an electrical consumption standpoint. And these things vary dramatically. Um, so I would say, in my experience, worst case scenario is typically the scenario we we tend to to travel along. Um, but but in any kind of planning, any kind of strategic planning, we always learn, you know, expect the worst, hope for the best, you know, plan for the worst. Well, we're not planning for the worst. So if we're anywhere close to these um, dramatic, dramatic increases, these hockey stick kind of growth, um, you know, if you look at the difference here in data center electric consumption by 2030, it's all the way from, you know, it's it's like eightfold almost, seven times. So we're within a range of seven times capacity um, based. And, and even though this is the expected data center, that middle red line, that is not what the utilities are planning for. That is not what our ability to construct energy is, is ready for. So if we're anywhere near that, that worst case scenario, um, we're we're in a world of hurt to supply these these um, these facilities. So uh, I did find just a couple of graphs. I don't want to bore you too much with the graphs because I'd love to have some discussion on this. But this one here, I found quite interesting that by 2030, communication technology globally might be 50% of all of the electric usage worldwide. I mean, that's obviously a high high usage case, but I don't think that's that unrealistic. Um, it may not be 50% when we talk about electrification of vehicles and how that's also going to add to the problem. But certainly the growth of AI 
which has its uh, 10 times the capacity or the need for electricity as standard searches and the like. Um, you know, those are those, and then the Internet of Things and cryptocurrency, all of these things we'll touch on. Um, that's going to add to a dramatic expected increase there. And, and this one was just the projected electricity uh, global supply. And, and it gives you a sense of just how far out of whack we're going to be if, we, if we're up on that high end. So you might ask, okay, well, why, why is there this need for electricity? I mean, why are these data centers um, pulling that much, that much power? Um, and, and the vast majority of it is cooling systems. Uh, these things require that uh, they generate a lot of heat. These processors generate a lot of heat. So it's a lot of cooling. So I would think when you're looking at co-locating these things, hopefully they'll start to look at cooler climates, perhaps. Um, I think it's going to be a balance of where is the electricity available, where is the infrastructure available, and then perhaps we can use natural cooling to a certain extent. Um, we'll start seeing a lot of these things warming up the Arctic, perhaps, who knows. Then you get lighting, um, the power conversion, you know, DC, AC, and all of that, hardware and servers server and storage. So it just gives you a little bit of a breakdown. So the thing that I would have thought, which is the servers, um, only about a quarter of the power consumption. The rest is is auxiliary. And, and of course, heating and cooling is the big thing, uh, mostly cooling. So uh, as I mentioned, AI requires 10 times the amount of power um, as uh, as traditional searches. So um, AI is uh, uh, primarily being powered today by NVIDIA uh, chips. So um, NVIDIA chips, they just as an example of what we're dealing with here, in 2023, NVIDIA shipped three, three, point, three and three quarters uh, million units. Okay, um, that if just to power what was shipped in 2023, they're going to need 14.4 gigawatts or terawatts, sorry, of, of power to, to handle those about the equivalent of 1.3 um, million U.S. households. So um, that's, that's something just coming from the wonderful world of AI. And I think a lot of these projections that I was just showing you are based not on AI, they're based on the more traditional models because some of this is a little bit, a um, couple of years old. Now, FERC is, is just protecting that the demand, peak demand on the grid will be 38 gigawatts over the next five years. So they're solely, I mean, really underestimating, I believe, um, the demand, even just looking at, at, um, at these data centers and the AI and the cryptocurrency, I, I think not counting electric vehicles. Um, I, I just really feel like our our regulatory infrastructure is just sleepwalking into into what's going to be quite a crunch when it comes to um, electrical demand. And and this crunch is going to become soon, sooner rather than later. I mean, we're we're really talking within the next five years. Uh, this crunch it becomes an issue. Uh, I did find, for instance, um, interesting when we talk about Bitcoin and the like. Um, oh, well, let's see. I think I had, I think I copied over. Oops. Yeah. Uh, this may be repeated in a later slide, but Bitcoin um, represents about two and a half percent of all of the U.S. electric consumption today. To me, that just blows my mind. Um, I mean, first off, I I'll admit it's it's sort of like um, hydrogen as a fuel source. Um, I'm prejudiced against Bitcoin. I just feel like it's it, it's it's sort of like if you're if you're not willing to invest all of your money in the currency of North Korea because you don't think it's stable, why would you invest it in a currency that's less stable than the currency of North Korea? I mean, it, it, it to me is a greater fool, fool's theory. But anyway, obviously now I've made all, all the all the crypto bros upset. But one thing that uh, finds uh, that I found interesting is, on average, it takes two hundred and sixty six thousand kilowatt hours 
to mine a single Bitcoin. So if you take that number times 18 cents a kilowatt hour, you're going to be spending almost $48,000 to generate on average one Bitcoin. So right there is sort of your market price in theory for this Bitcoin. And it only represents the invested cost in electricity. So um, doesn't strike me as a really... Um, doesn't make sense. Doesn't make sense to me at all. Okay. Can I just just a point on that? You know, Bitcoin is just one value which is established on top of a blockchain. And sorry, my camera just gave up for some reason. Yeah. And uh, even if you don't if you don't buy into the Bitcoin, I wouldn't invest in it either. The blockchain technology depends on a similar technology in terms of guessing a, a secret code to validate a a transaction. We need a substantially more efficient, energy efficient way of adding blocks to a chain, whether you're using it for bit for Bitcoin or for contract management. And so I think uh, the Bitcoin will go up and down, but I think the blockchain world is in desperate need of a more efficient approach. Yeah, and and I did run across a couple of. Uh articles about that as I was doing some of this research. And apparently there are different techniques that can be used, one of which is much less energy intensive than the current uh, way of some sort of confirmation. But I didn't even want to pretend to understand it. Um, you know, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna hopefully remain a Luddite around cryptocurrency my entire life uh, and and watch these things um uh, it it just I every time I hear about Bitcoin I think about tulips, you know, and and it, you know the whole price thing of tulips way back when. It just strikes me as one of those things that makes no sense. It's obviously going to make a lot of people a lot of money, and it's going to make other people no money at all. But it, I'm not going to participate. Um, okay, so another another problem here is uh, aging infrastructure. And I just threw this in because this is one of those things that uh, we tend to forget about. Um, but the good news is Europe's in worse shape than we are. <laughs> the bad news is we're in bad shape. Uh, the average regional power grid infrastructure is about 40 years old. These, these systems were designed with an average life expectancy of around 40 years. So, so we're already dealing with this major aging infrastructure. At the same time, um, we're dealing with this hockey stick um, demand curve that's due to what we're focused on here today, data centers and crypto. That's part of it. Blockchain could expand all into whole other areas if they all are that energy and uh, hungry. And then, of course, electric vehicles throw on top of that. I don't even know what the Internet of Things, what energy uh, demands that imposes. But I think it's safe to say that no matter how much we estimate the amount of electricity that's going to be required, we're going to be underestimating it. Uh, so so we're in this transition period that um, is we have to replace what we've been dependent on for the last four decades at the same time that we're seeing a doubling in demand over the next six, eight years. Uh, at the same time that our regulatory infrastructure for providing infrastructure is, is pretty well broken. So those things coming in to play um, all at the same time tend to make me um, wanting my own personal, I'm gonna be a prepper when it comes to the world of energy. And I think we're seeing that these these um, data centers are feeling the same way. Uh, so they're getting kind of in prepper mode, uh, wanting to create that um, that kind of resiliency, the resiliency that the uh, regulated utility company cannot provide. So that's going to lead to these super resilient um, localized energy sources. Um, and when I say localized, I don't mean for you and me. Uh, these are very specific to the industry. And the reason why they're that they're gonna they're gonna invest heavily is just look at the kind of uh, monetary value of downtime 
that these guys are looking at. The average da data center, they're figuring factoring in $9,000 a minute for downtime. When the grid goes down, 9,000 bucks a minute in some high risk industries like healthcare, manufacturing, transportation, it can be as much as $5 million an hour. So, so you're going to for sure invest heavily in, in um, backup and resiliency on that. Um, larger facilities, they even for five minutes, they're talking about 50,000 bucks. So if you're investing millions in, in redundant energy sources, it's probably an investment that's going to pay off fairly quickly. Uh, so you're going to see a lot of money being pumped into that. Maybe it's a business opportunity for those folks who are on the call. Um, so, so how are they reacting? Uh, it's kind of an all of the above activity. Um, hydrogen, again, I, I feel like hydrogen, my, my little, um, quote that I like to give out on this is that hydrogen is the technology of the future and always will be. Um, it's, it's just too expensive, uh, as an alternative. Uh, compared to battery backup, but who knows, you know, with these, with these data centers, um, these data centers are, um, they have money, they have a lot of money. So they may invest in that, they may find that practical, certainly creating their own microgrids. Um, geothermal, I just, I ran across a video about uh, data centers being um, developed at geothermal locations. Uh, with this express purpose, they're developing these geothermal power plants just to run data centers. Um, nuclear, this was another one that somebody sent me a copy of um, this week, which prompted this discussion. Uh, in Pennsylvania, they're talking about uh, revitalizing or, or restarting up Three Mile Island uh, with the real, with the, with the purpose of using that power for data centers. I think it's uh, Amazon. Amazon wants to start up Three Mile Island again. Um, my Microsoft. Oh, go ahead. I was just saying it's Microsoft. I sent it to you. Oh, oh okay. You yeah, well, the, the reason I mentioned Amazon is, oh, I guess it's Amazon Vice. I probably with Microsoft trying to get some of that power there. Yeah, so, so that, you know, what could go wrong? Um, you know, and there has been discussion. I think Bill Gates has been in the middle of this, pushing these, um, they, I forget the term they use, like micro nuclear or something like that, where they talk about like tractor trailer size nuclear power plants that that can be brought on site and, and modularized uh, that are designed to power things like data centers. So, so there has been this movement here. Well, why has that movement been gaining a bit of traction? It's because you're dealing with, with high energy demands that are critical as far as economically critical for these and with people who have a lot of money. Um, so they're um, going to go for whatever actually will work. Clearly, these guys, they're going to go for the low, low um, cost um, solution first. But but if it requires a heavier investment to make sure it's more robust, that's what they'll do as well. Um, lithium ion batteries, this one's kind of hard to read down in the bottom corner, but lithium is definitely coming of age. A lot of these data centers now looking at battery backup. Battery backup has a big advantage, of course, because it's instantaneous. You can have that power plant online within a microsecond of the grid going down, whereas you know, nuclear would have to be a, a baseload kind of situation. Uh, any of these others, there's going to be some lag time before, um, you know, when the grid goes down and they transfer over to their backup. And then, of course, wind and solar. I think we talked about before that these like four or five companies are responsible for about a quarter to a third of all of the wind and solar that's been installed in the U.S. And this is primarily to meet their data center and cloud um, requirements. So that's been a big driver of solar over the years, and we're just going to see that continue. Um, the AEP proposal. So I guess the question is, okay, all of this is happening. Well, the utilities are not unaware of this. Um, and the utilities are being asked to provide a significant amount of infrastructure to facilitate the, the building of these data centers. Um, 
I could, I, I, I can really sympathize. It, it pains me to say I can sympathize with AEP and with these utilities because essentially they're being said, okay, we want you to bring this infrastructure to our business. Um, this business probably, well, definitely is speculative. You know, from AEP's perspective, you're saying, okay, you want me to come and invest in this infrastructure. You may or may not be here next next year. I, I think it's a fair assumption data centers are only going to grow and 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 become more prolific. But who knows? If it were cryptocurrency and I was on the board of AEP, I would say, you know what? I don't know that they're going to be here next year. I don't believe in this technology. Um, you want me as a company to invest many hundreds of millions of dollars to supply an industry that I don't think is actually going to survive. Yeah. Forget it. You're on your own. <laughs> so, so that's an issue. So AEP comes up with this proposal and says, okay, if we're going to invest in this, you better guarantee that you're not going to, as soon as you get this access to the grid, develop your own power source. You know, here I've developed this infrastructure to bring you power. And now you put in your own solar array, your own wind farm, your own nuclear power plant, and I'm not getting the return on my investment. So, so I can sympathize with where they're coming from. Um, but that creates another issue when it comes to um, where these systems are going to be located. Uh, I, I really feel like what we're going to see is a situation where over the next six years, we're going to see increasingly grid demand outstripping supply. So in any marketplace, the first thing that happens is the cost goes up. Well, this is a regulated industry. And, uh, you know, costs will not be real time. You know, you apply and you get a you get a change. Well, we're already seeing grid prices going up pretty dramatically. So it's an indication this is already starting to happen. But what happens if it happens very, very quickly? Um, and you're now in competition with Amazon or Google to get your electricity. Um, so so as a consumer, as a homeowner, Will one segment of, of the electrical consumption pie chart be in competition with the other segments for power? You know, if, if it comes to rolling blackouts and Amazon is fighting me, I suspect I'm going to lose. Um, I suspect they're going to be given a higher priority. The only way to avoid that is probably through some sort of regulatory uh, rules and requirements where the politicians step in and say, you know what, we have to give first priority to the residential customers, second priority to this, and you guys are low down on the totem pole, Mr. Data Center or Mr. Cryptocurrency. I'm not 100% convinced that if Amazon walks in with a big bucket of money, that's the way it's going to play out. Um, so, so I just feel like we're going to see power bidding going on within segments of the pie. And then the other thing is where are we going to locate these, these, um, facilities? Well, sort of like auto manufacturing has been locating where labor is cheap. These kind of communication systems are going to be locating, where energy is cheap. So, so do you begin to see regions marketing themselves and competing against each other based on the cost of electricity for these highly desirable industries? And if they're not truly able to produce at those low costs, then will other customers be asked to subsidize that? Um, not asked, but basically made to. Um, so, so then you begin to say, all right, how are, how is this technology allocation? How is the grid, the availability of the grid, the availability of energy generation sources and the like, how is that going to change the way industry, um, locates around the country? So these are just a few thoughts that occurred to me as I was putting this together. I'd like to open it up here for a couple of minutes and see, Al, you've got a, you've got a comment exactly. 
Right yes, uh, to follow up with what you just said, especially the idea of grid grid demand will outstrip grid supply. Obviously, that will raise the price in a in a in a normal market. Who knows if this is going to be a normal market? But I think that my prediction would be that ultimately that will lead to de to more and more decentralized power generation, whether that's on the roof of an apartment building, on a home, uh, on a on a strip mall on any other commercial business, if I can, if the cost of installing uh, decentralized power generation of any kind um, is uh, less than the cost of buying my power from the grid, why wouldn't I do that? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a realistic assessment. Um, you know, it's sort of like when the power goes out in a big storm, everybody runs out and buys a generator. You know, we're we're seeing every time AEP or any of the utilities raise their rates, it makes solar more affordable. So we've been seeing this happening, you know, in in drips and dribbles. I think we're going to see it happening in big chunks. And as an industry, we're going to have to be prepared for this on again, off again, huge demand, sort of like everybody rushing and buying liquor and, and bottled water when a storm is approaching. I think we're going to see that coming at us as a solar industry. What? I think you're muted there, Al. You, I see you're talking. I'm I'm uh, currently paying 15, 16 cents a kilowatt hour. Um, I have a uh, Ohio Edison or whatever it's called now, and AEP is my supplier. But if the price were to go to 20, 22, 25 cents a kilowatt hour, I would add more solar. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there, there's got to be there's got to be a point at which, uh, why should I pay some? And I would probably add more battery capacity and go and as much as possible go off grid. Yeah, I think we're seeing the utilities in their policies almost forcing that as an issue, yep. where they start saying, "Okay, we're going to now charge you because you're not buying as much power because you've added in solar because we raised our price. Now we're going to charge you forty five, fifty, sixty, seventy dollars a month." just to connect to the grid. So then you go, okay, well then I don't need to connect to the grid. Um, I'm going to just go energy independent. Um, or we may see competing um, microgrid companies cropping up. Uh, we may see virtual power plant companies cropping up. We may see Apple and, and Tesla and all these other players get into the utility marketplace and say, you know what, they are failing you with their business model. We can come in and do it better and cheaper uh, and and so that's going to just be it. Once again, we keep coming down to the fact that if I were in the utility industry, I wouldn't want to be in the utility industry because because it's problematic. Um, their their business model that they have relied on for the last hundred years is not functional in today's reality, and it will be less functional over the coming decade or so. I think that's fair to say. Anybody else have any any comments or anything they want to add in here? Yeah, Jay, quick question for you. Sure. Um, you know, we talk about if the prices go up enough that people will just choose to go off grid. I was having a chat with someone on Reddit and they said, they put this out there that legislation can be passed that would prevent disconnection from the utility. And they cited some you know, occupancy requirement for the home where you need to have be connected to the utilities is they they have suggested that this is already in place in some parts of the country. Anyway, I just wanted to know if there's any truth to any of that. What's 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 the deal? Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Um, I don't know. I don't know of any specific instance where that's been a requirement, but I do know that it is a requirement in some places for water and sewer. Um, if the city has uh, provided water and sewer to your neighborhood, you must hook up to it. Um, so I see no reason that um, that will not take place in some jurisdictions. I, I assume that's going to happen. Then the question is, how enforceable is it? Um, you know, and and do they really want to to sort of walk down that that pathway, especially when load demand is already exceeding capacity? Is that a battle mm -hmm. that everybody wants to fight? 
you know. Right. How, how can they make me pay the utility for something they don't provide me? Yeah. Just claim your homage <laughs> at that point. That's all you got to do. Religious freedom, you know, ah, <laughs> there I'm you right. go. I'll keep that in my back pocket. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Um, maybe time for one more question. If anyone's got it, then we'll, we'll have to drop off. Give anybody. All right. Okay, well, hearing none, um, let's call it a day. Uh, I'm going to skip next week. I'm going to be traveling. So uh, I'll see you guys all in two weeks. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.